Amen. You believe that today? Amen. I want more of the Holy Spirit today than I ever had in my life. Last Sunday I said the same thing. I've said it so many times in my life. I, I still believe that. <laughs> I still want that. And I believe that He's doing that. And I pray that's what He's doing within your life as well. I hope that your week has been awesome in His presence. And I pray that no matter what the world has tossed your way, that you have come out victorious. Because it's not about you or me. It's about the presence of what we just sung about today. The presence of God operating every day in our lives. Amen? It really is. And you've come here today, some of you, of saying in your life, I'm coming to try this church or trying to see what this pastor's like. And... Um, these people are like and don't know what to anticipate. I don't know if they'll even like me. The reality is they might even give you a hug or handshake or what I always say, a $20 bill by the end of the service. You just never know about these folks. They're awesome. Some will give you bags of tomatoes and others will take you out for lunch. Others will invite you over to their home. Others will try to help you whenever you have a need in your life. Or if you have something as simple as car tires in your front yard, They'll even offer to move those for you, too, if you let them. <laughs> They'll do that. That's who we are. We actually are a church of a 1,000 people that you don't see. There's a bunch of us just gone right now, and we actually don't run that many right now. But I do believe God's got a plan for this church. And uh, we have to have about four services to have that many. We've never had more than one service that I know of yet. But, uh, hey, with God, nothing will be impossible. Are you okay with that? <laughs> He said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, I will be there in the midst of them. And if there's one among us today who's never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life, the songs we've been singing today is about his salvation, his permanence, his residency within our life. You see, within our life, we're either the president of our heart or he is in charge of our heart. If he is in charge of our heart, the more that you give him of the amount of heart you have, if you give him 50% of your heart, then you're basically still calling the shots. And you're wanting him to live in your life, but you're still in charge. Not until the Lord God has 100% of every part of your spirit, your being, of who you are, will he be the president of your life, so to speak. You still call shots. You still have the right to choose what direction you want to go through the day. But there's all of a sudden, it's like this sensation, uh, like... Um, not necessarily quite like when Nita and I were dating over 41 years ago. Uh, 42, 43 is a long time ago. We're getting old, aren't we? But it's like the imagination that you think somebody is standing right behind you, like a parent or something, and you get all this romantic thing feeling, uh, guys, and you walk up to that lady and you're, you're just wanting to look deep in her swimming eyes. Then you realize there's someone right behind you. It wasn't my parents. There came a time, I have a brother named Philip who lives in Jacksonville, and he's eight years younger than we are, uh, than Nita and I. And uh, when he was younger and we were dating as teenagers, we'd go sit on the front porch of my parents' house, and it was kind of dark and secluded, and that's what happens when you date. You know, you, you try to imagine what the other person looks like without seeing them, right? That's all that it is. You just sit there and don't touch each other. You don't. I'm not going down the wrong path here, I promise. Just trust me a moment. <laughs> Your laughter's telling me you've been there before. Amen. It's <laughs> good to know. Then out of somewhere, you just get ready to, man, you know, to make that move or whatever it is you call it nowadays. <laughs> and then there's this voice that comes in and says, hey, what y'all doing? And it's your eight-year-old brother who's standing behind. You know, if I had more money back then, I could have paid him off more money and got rid of him faster. It seemed like he'd say, hey, I'll go if you give me a quarter. Here's 50 cents, stay twice as long, okay. <laughs> Next time we showed up, he's right there, you know. See, the Holy Spirit shows up. He's not asking for quarters. Holy Spirit's not looking for something you can give to him other than your trust in the Lord God. He'll show up when you least expect it, and just when you're ready to cross that line and go into sin, you think nobody knows what's going on. There's an old, old country western singer named Charlie Rich who had a song way back, ooh, in the 70s, I guess it was. And the title of the song was, 
No one knows what goes on behind closed doors. The Holy Spirit knows what's going on in our lives. Amen? The reality is, that's why you're here today. You're not here by accident. You're here by, I believe, divine appointment. God has brought every one of us here, me too, that God has brought us here that we can hear whatever His voice He's wanting to tell us this very day. He's here. The Holy Spirit is present in this room this very moment. But He's in the church down the street. He's in the church across the country and across the world. He's wherever we usher in and allow His presence to come in and where Jesus' name is lifted up. The Bible says that when His name is lifted up, He will draw all people unto Himself. There are obstacles that come in our way and at times we think we're getting ready to cross that line. And you may be here today and you've never asked Christ into your heart. You should do that before you leave this sanctuary this very day. It's a real simple process. It can happen even right where you're seated at now. But the Holy Spirit will come and speak to you and there's a voice that will say, you're being drawn to God. And you're thinking about the things that you have in your life. And there's a guilt. There's a, there's a sadness and a guilt. And you grieve over that. You're heartbroken to a place where you realize that you hurt the heart of God. And then in, in that time process, you could be sitting there smiling and looking at someone and looking a thousand miles across the way because you're so focused upon what's inside of your heart. And you miss completely what the other person might be saying right in front of you. And if that's what's happening right now in your lives, then praise be to God. Because He wants to come in and speak to every one of our hearts this day for whatever reason, whatever you need. Oh, you don't know, Pastor, I've been a Christian for a long time. Uh, me too. I just looked in the front of my Bible this morning and looked at the date when I bought this Bible. And I bought this Bible back in 1986, which means it's at least 40 years old. The pages, I have to keep taping them up. 30. Uh, yes, what I mean, 30 years. Did I say 40 years? <laughs> I mean, somebody's awake out there anyway. What date was that? Well, it's not important now, I know. Now I'm at the point I'm trying to clarify. Oh, I'm sorry, take that back. March 26th, 1982. Okay, oh. Miss, Miss Math. How many years ago? Okay, that's good. You see, I've been a Christian. I came, became a Christian March 21st, 1976. So from that point to this day, God is still shaping this old boy. He's still working his work inside my life. He didn't just let it happen and then let me go. He's still working on me every day. Every day I have to die to self. Every day I have to put Him first. Every day I have to call upon the Lord God. It's not a prayer of repentance for sin. I'm not saying that this never happened throughout my lifetime. But I'm saying today, when I woke up this morning, there has to be the sin issue. The very fact that I'm human this very day, I need the Lord's help in my life. You and I, we cannot exist in this world. When you have the political scene that pops on the TVs, and you watch the convention last week, and you might watch one this coming week, Whatever happens, you're going to make value judgments. Well, he's this, or she's that, or they're this, or they're that, or how I agree with this, or I disagree with that. Well, big deal. It's not about them at all. It's not about you. It's not about me. I don't mean that to be offensive in a way, but hear what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say I need you to realize this world is not dictated upon what human beings do or what happens in the White House. It all happens through the will of the Lord God. And he's allowing these things to happen. And no matter who gets elected into office, you and I will serve them with as much gusto and support and, uh, and prayerfulness because the Lord wants us to do that. Read Romans chapter 13. That will help you out about authority in your life. But you and I cannot receive Jesus Christ today unless you bow down to the authority of the Lord God. He cannot and will not fill you with his spirit unless you or I surrender or consecrate ourselves fully to his will. In your worship folder today, it talks about overcoming obstacles. We set many of those obstacles up. We put our own walls up, a defense. We carry suitcases around of burdens that are, we're walking with, and we have this load of 14, 15 different things we're carrying around, it seems like. We have a ball and chain. Husbands, I'm not talking about your wives. That's what you used to say sometimes. But you have these things that you carry around within your life. And you're expecting to have victory and you're smiling at everybody and you're singing kumbaya and you're wanting the Lord God to bless your life and you have all this baggage that's on you. These obstacles that are standing in your way and you stand fearful 
You're afraid of what other people might think if you make a decision in church about waving your hand or celebrating God or saying, praise God. I told people the very first Sunday I moved here uh, almost 10 years ago and said, if you can't say amen, at least do the chop or do the chomp. Do one of those things, but at least let me know that you're out there. Amen. Woo! Praise God. We want you to realize this is a place of joy and peace and freedom. You're among family here. It's like going home. You can relax. You can take your shoes off. You can do that in church if that will help you to relax. We want you to realize that the presence of the living God is here. We're not like other churches, but realize this. They are not like this church as well. There's a quality and ingredient in this church family that you can't find in other places. The Church of the Nazarene as a whole is a part of a denomination that goes across the world. And just to summarize it on this one, because I have to quit because I just saw what time it was. Where you'll, you can go to any Church of the Nazarene, you'll find a lot of similarities to what you'll find here. And when thousands of us will go together next year to a General Assembly in Indianapolis, Indiana, we will meet together up to 25,000 people across the world. And we'll, it'll be as if there's, it's like we, we just haven't seen each other for a few weeks. When our son Robert was 12, he went to his first general assembly with us, and, and uh, these people kept coming up to me and they said, Hey, Dave, how are you doing? Oh, all this, we're talking. Hey, good to see you. Hugging and high fiving and shaking hands. And after a while, after about like 100 people, he said, Man, Does Dad know everybody in the church? No. There's something, this collegial uh, friendship that happens within the life of the believer of Jesus Christ, that we're a part of his family. And the obstacles that you have, I want you to realize that there are people in this room who will help you to overcome your obstacles. If you put your trust in God and let them walk with you through the fire, they'll lead you and they'll give you some guidance. They really will. What I want to talk with you about today is asking you, starting off with this question, what did you want to become when you grew up? Some of you are still becoming. Some of you are still growing up. Some of you are still in college. God is still doing a work in so many of your lives. But some of you are 70s and 80s. Have you grown up yet? My mama told me to grow up one day, and I grew up. That was bad. I didn't listen to what she said, and so I've been trying to grow taller, and I can't seem to get any taller. But when you grow up, you have dreams about being a fireman or a policeman or a governor or mayor, or you want to be a school teacher, you want to be a professor. Is there something that you want to be? You want to be the majorette or be the army general. You want to be the the treasurer of the United States of America, Karen. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> what is it that you want to be? Have you gotten there yet? Have you come to that place? Have you given up on your dreams? We've been talking over the past few weeks of time about there's freedom and forgiveness. When you forgive someone of something has happened against you and you forgive them, God will come back and He'll bless your life in a special way. And you may not realize the pain that they've carried, although you'll think about it often. And our focal point over the past few weeks of time is about a character named Joseph. Joseph, his whole story starts off in Genesis chapter 37 and runs till the end of Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 50. And in that compilation of his story, we hear a lot. He starts off by realizing that he's 17, he has a coat of many colors, and he tells his brothers and his parents that one day they're all going to have to bow down to him. Well, the Bible says that really did happen. But at the time, his family thought it was pretty arrogant <laughs> that this dreamer could pose such a question. Do you realize that you'll be bowing down before me one day? Well, no. Can't see that in my future at all. And his brothers then take him, and the Bible says in chapter 37, well, they take him in verse 19 through 20, and they say, let's take this dreamer, let's go take him away. He's a favorite of the Father, but let's go take him and take the coat off and let's stain it with some animal's blood, take him back to the Father and say that some wild animal came and took his life, and he's dead. And then we'll see what becomes of this dreamer. He was sold into slavery, and the brothers thought, ha, 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 out of here. Zoom. See ya. <laughs> 20 to 22 years later, they're hungry for food. And they go to Egypt because they hear that Egypt had a bumper crop of wheat and grain. So they go and they take all their items to trade, to barter, to do whatever they can to get the grain so they can have some bread. They can eat something to satisfy them. 
And they see this man who's under Pharaoh. He's the second in charge of all of the land. And he says uh, he knows who they are. Because the older brothers, he already knew who they It's like they don't change very much. Our parents tends to stay the same when we're older. But when we're younger, when we become older, sometimes it changes a lot. So he knew who they were. And all of a sudden, he was going to play with them and make them squirm a little bit. And the rest of the story, you already know, we've talked about over the past few weeks of time, those of you that have been here. But just to help others who haven't been here to say this, he makes them squirm a little bit. And they don't know who he is because he was younger, and when he became older, his appearance changed undoubtedly enough that they didn't know who he was. He didn't have any particular markings or tattoos, or he didn't have anything that kind of said, hey, I belong to uh, uh, Jacob. I'm Jacob's son, the one you threw into the pit and sold into slavery. He didn't have any of that. He just kind of waited it out. And all of a sudden, before he knew it, he realized if he wasn't careful, he'd cross a line. You ever been up to that line? You've been to that line when you know you're stopping, you're ready to cross this line of do not return. I mean, you cross it, you know you've stepped into sin. You know you've had greed or lust or you've had something you step across. And those of you who stepped across, you know how it feels. That's where sin comes in. But it's the Holy Spirit of God who comes and says, hold back, you don't need to give in to this. You're going to make it if you just trust me on this. So Joseph held on for the rest of his life and kept hearing those promptings. And until he died at the age of 110, he never went against the will of God into sin that we know of through the Bible, what it said. Incredible. He was like you and me. Probably went through so many options and so many obstacles that confronted him. But instead of giving in, he held on. He understood what forgiveness is about. And these brothers were before him. He sends them home. They get the father, bring the father back. And he then confronts them and tells them who, exactly who he is. But basically, he forgives them. In chapter 50, verse 20, it says, What you intended to do for harm towards me, God intended it for good and for the saving of many lives. He was able to not only save his own family's lives, but the Thousands, countless, who knows how many, possibly millions, lived because of his faithfulness to God. Well, what does that mean? That means out of all the obstacles he had, he held on until the very end. Again, he didn't listen to his head. He didn't listen to his emotions. He followed steady within his heart and trusted God's leadership in his life. When something bad happened, something bad necessarily wasn't happening to him. He was in the situation. He was in the environment. And you and I have been taught as little children, fight and take care of yourselves. If, if, if you don't fight, no one's going to take up for you. So you have to launch back. But that's not what Joseph is trying to teach us. Just when someone does something wrong to you, I'm not saying it's not right for you to defend yourself if you need to defend yourself. But honey, if you go looking for trouble, you probably deserve the outcome of whatever happens. He's saying when trouble comes your way, you haven't gone looking for it, but it comes looking for you. You need to be the man or woman of God who will stand tall no matter how dark the day seems, no matter how bright the fire is, no matter how spooky or how ghoulish the demons of hell come towards you, that you need to be able to take a stand, stand up tall, and realize that you are protected because you honor and allow the Lord God to have your entire being. You're protected. You're insulated. You'll be able to go through the fire. It doesn't mean you won't be afraid. It doesn't mean you won't... A wonder about what's about to happen next doesn't mean you won't have some adrenal, uh, adrenaline that's going to be flowing through your body. You'll be all over the place, danger everywhere before you. But if you will stay straight and you'll keep your eyes upon the Lord God and even just sing to Him. The song we just sang, Grace, Grace, whatever song that might come your way, just keep singing, keep humming. If you can't think of anyone, the one that a lot of people sing is Amazing Grace. Amazing grace. Then you start seeing things. You might be going, how sweet this sound to say, that much like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. Sometimes when you get scared, you sing a little faster. <laughs> the Holy Spirit won't leave you or forsake you. Jesus promised he will always be with us to the very end. But he says those who will be faithful to the end, the same will be saved. Joseph had a dream. He had the grandest personal dreams throughout the whole Bible. But yet, for many people, if many people would have had the setback that Joseph had, many of us would have just given up. We'd surrendered. We'd have given in to what the problem is. 
And it would have destroyed the future dream of what God has planned and planted within your heart already. God's got great plans within your life. Well, what is it? Can you tell me what God's dream is for my life? No. But I know what He's told me and what He's worked within my life. And I know that He is doing a work that I can't even imagine. He's called us to different things. And when you have His calling, it's for you. It's unlike for anybody else. Joseph had many reasons to be uninvolved in other people's lives, but he gave his energy to help with other people to receive their dreams. God probably wants you and me also to help other people to achieve their dreams. You see, he could have backed away because his dreams weren't uh, coming true. Uh, his brothers had been uh, wronging towards him. God, how can you let my brothers do that towards me? I'm just ticked off or whatever holy phrase you could use, you know, that sounds clean in front of your parents or something like that, you know, <laughs> or your children. He didn't feel like his circumstances were fair. He felt like things were happening to him. You see, he, he could have just checked out any time he wanted, but he chose not to. I believe this, your attitude determines your actions. There's a few people, if you'll give me just a moment here, I'm going to tell you a couple of great thinkers in our society, and you'll know some of their names. For example, the great psychologist William James, he said, the greatest discovery in his generation was that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitude of mind. Change your thinking, change your future. Change your thinking, change your future. But what I'm trying to stress to you is not change your thinking alone, but allow God to change your heart, and your future will change as well. You see, he's talking about altering the way you think. But I extend to you, when someone bows at an altar, A-L-T-A-R, of God, your eternity will be exposed. It will tell you when you surrender to the Lord God, you will know what your future is going to be held out for you. Amen? He wants you to realize you can have great confidence in God's direction. David Brinkley, the TV journalist, said this, A successful person is one who can lay a firm foundation with the bricks others have thrown at them. When someone tosses a brick your way, it doesn't mean you have to throw it back. Because you can be the victor if you don't throw it. Many times that's seen as a sign of weakness if you don't retaliate. But you don't have to retaliate to show how big you are. Amen? Victor Frankl, psychologist and Holocaust survivor in World War II, he said the last of our human freedoms are to choose the attitude or is to choose the attitude in any given circumstance. Frankl is one who history tells that the Germans came in, the Nazis came in rather, and stripped him physically of all of his clothing as they did with other people, trying to get, get him to surrender, to give up his trust in God or his trust in his country or his trust in anybody else to break him down. And by stripping him physically, completely naked before humanity, he told them, he said, you can take all the clothing off of me. But you can't take what I have hidden inside of my heart. When you have the Lord God in your heart, friend, they can't take that from you unless you submit it and surrender it. Unless you stood here in the sanctuary one day and they very well may use this sanctuary, the devil, through a time of tribulation, may put a guillotine in here. It will no longer be a time of worship of the Lord. But on the fence and you can't make a decision to trust God before this happens, you very well may be confronted with the very fact of what you will do. You will become a martyr if you trust in God. And you might lose your head over that. But if you don't trust God during that time, the Bible says you will become as when you take the mark of the beast, that you'll become, a, you'll be cast out forever. And one day you'll go into a devil's lake of fire. It'll be forever and forever. So what's so hard about trusting Jesus Christ? Why is it so hard for us to say, to surrender, to bow our knees down, to trust in the Lord our God? I mean on a daily basis. Not just when a car accident happens. Not when someone's sick in the hospital. Not when you have no finances. When you don't have a job or you don't want the future is going to be. Or somebody bigger than you is picking on you. Oh Lord, help me. He will help you when you call upon Him. But why can't we just enjoy His presence on a regular outcome of daily living? That's what He wants, that daily relationship. Frankel learned that secret. Eugene Peterson, who was the author of the Message Bible, he said, pity is one of the noblest emotions uh, available to human beings. Self-pity is possibly most 
ignoble, an incapacity, a crippling emotional disease that severely distorts our perception of reality. He said pity is a narcotic that leaves the addict wasted and derelict. When we feel sorry for ourselves, we feel like no one cares for us. When we realize at times that there's just no one standing there and we're, we've been uh, able to beg other people to take care of our needs <coughs> and we fail to ask Jesus Christ to come and help us, He stands ready. Our attitudes will determine our actions. And until the attitude changes like the friend told me one time, the acrostic, Although this thing is tough, until delivered, endure. When you walk through the valley, the shadow of death does again does not mean that you're going to die. It means you're seeing death and manglements all around you. But you will walk faithful straight ahead to the Lord your God and keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Like Simon Peter when he was in the ocean and, and the Sea of Galilee, that is, and Jesus called him to come out, out of the boat. Step out of the boat. Come into the storm of life. And as long as Simon Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he never sank. When he started looking at all the environment around him, he began to say, sink. And the first thing he did to call out is three words. Jesus, save me. When we put our focus on the environment and the people around, we need his salvation. But when we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and him, Completely, He will help us to work through every situation within our life. Amen. And here's what, in a quick summary, here's what was happening. Joseph helped everybody he was helping them with their dreams. And do you realize everyone that he helped, God not only blessed that person, say for example, Potiphar. Not only did he bless Potiphar and his whole household, he blessed Joseph and anyone who was connected to Joseph was blessed. And I'll touch on that for a moment. Sometimes, though, our life is a little bit like the parakeet named Chippy. You ever heard about Chippy? Chuck Swindoll, Pastor Chuck Swindoll tells a story. I understand. I haven't heard it for a long time. Chippy is a parakeet. Chippy is in his bird cage, and his owner, uh, she's so happy that Chippy is so uh, happy of a parakeet, so she decides she's going to go and clean out the bottom of his cage for him and do it with a vacuum cleaner to clean out the seeds and the other feathers in the bottom of the uh, cage and uh, use a vacuum cleaner, and I'll leave it at that. So she was there, and the cage door is open, and she takes her vacuum, she's starting to vacuum, and all of a sudden, when the telephone rang, and just let that gel for a second, the hose is inside the cage, she turns to get the phone, and when she turns to get the phone, she hears a whisk and a swoop. <laughs> Looks back, Chippy is gone. She's done sucked him up the vacuum cleaner tube. So she hangs the phone up and she quickly goes and unzips the side of the bag and pulls her little parakeet out. And he's all full of black dust and so she thinks, oh my, I'm about to kill my bird. He seems to be okay, but he's stunned, but he's, he's gonna make it. So she kind of blows him off a little bit. That's not enough, so she thinks, I know what I'll do. I'll take him into the bathtub. She went into the bathtub and turns the water on and holds him under the faucet and all this icy cold water is just pummeling this little parakeet. And he's just shivering as could be. And she's trying to clean him off. Then she realizes the damage that she has done with this little parakeet. And he's like, oh, what am I going through? She goes and takes the blow dryer, turns it on, and <laughs> she's blowing a little heat on top of him, trying to dry him off, you know, feathers. You know, kind of going up and down. And finally, he's just there. The moral of the story is this. Chippy just doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> he's afraid of the obstacles. But you see, the problem is, it's a good example of what happens to you and I, that Joseph chose not to just sit back and say, woe is me, I'm a weak worm of the dust, I'm a nobody. All these people are picking on me. He got involved. And God used him, and God blessed other people that he touched. But see, Chippy's story, even as fun as that may sound, many of us are just like Chippy. We have that kind of attitude. We check out, and we say, oh, I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to 
let this thing happen in my life and I'm going to let whatever's going on change the color of my direction. And I'm just not going to get involved. Don't let that happen. Because what God intended for harm, for what others tried to do for harm towards Joseph, God intended it for good and the saving of many people. God wants to save people through your lives. Do you realize that? It's not that you just show up on a Sunday morning and you go home and you live a whole week and you come back to church and, or whatever you get involved in, a life group or Wednesday night times or whatever happens. You, don't, you just don't. I mean, that's not what life is all about as a Christian. Your life is an example, is a witness of Jesus Christ seven days of the week. 300 and how many days do we have now in the year? <laughs> there you go. Every day of our life is a witness for Jesus Christ. Are you okay with that? I hope so because that's what God's calling you to do this very day. Amen. What obstacles are keeping you from fully surrendering your heart completely to the will of God? I have a quick poem. Can you bear with me for a moment? I want to read this story. There's a little poem. I want to read about these two frogs. Two frogs fell into a can of cream, or so I've been told, or so it's been told. The sides of the can were shining and steep. The cream was deep and cold. Oh, what's the use, said number one. Tis fate, no helps around. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye, cruel world. And weeping still, he drowned. But number two, a sterner stuff, Dog paddled in surprise, and while he wiped his creamy face and dried his creamy eyes, I'll swim a while, at least, he said, or so it has been said. It wouldn't really help the world if one more frog was dead. An hour or two he kicked and swam, not once he stopped to mutter, but kicked and swam and swam and kicked and hopped out via butter. <laughs> Have you quit kicking within your life? What's God trying to help you see? Because Joseph chose in this story to remind us that he chose to be involved in the lives of other people. The Bible says in Genesis 39, 2, that the Lord was with Joseph and blessed him greatly as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. There's a story about, you can see the verse there, and I don't have to go through all of it for Potiphar, but it says... He blessed him in all the ways, and Joseph was in charge of everything in his house. The only thing Potiphar had to do was decide, the only decision he had to make for the day, because Joseph did it all, the only decision Potiphar had to make was, what do I want to eat today? That's it. Joseph did everything. The jailer had a dream in Genesis 39, verse 22 23. And the jailer put Joseph in charge of everything. He didn't have to do anything. And everything worked out great for the jailer and for Joseph. Then there's the cupbearer for Pharaoh. His cupbearer dream in Genesis 40. What happens there is that Joseph says, I know I've been here and I know the dream that you have. And he told him the, the dream. And he says, by the way, when you get out, would you put in a good word for, to Pharaoh for me? Would you remind him I've been here under wrong circumstances? That's what they all say, right? I didn't do it. Well, he really didn't do it. He's at the wrong place at the wrong time, but God used it anyway. He says, just tell Pharaoh about me. Well, when the time came and the cupbearer was able to be released three days later from the interpretation of his dream, he went by Pharaoh and never said one word about Joseph. There are people that call you friend, but when the time comes that you need for them to friend up towards you, sometimes they just forget that you even are existing because they're going to take care of them. You know why? That's that sin of self-centeredness. When you have a sin of self-centeredness inside of us, when we do that, we don't think about anybody else's care but ourselves. There's a lot of people who care for other people. But you can care for other people and still be self-centered. Unless the Lord God is number one in your life above everyone else, He's not Lord at all. Pharaoh had a dream in Genesis 41, and I wrap it with this. He appointed him over everything. And when Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of everything other than ruling the country, there's where the people came and bowed down. His own family came and bowed. So what does this all have to do? What happened to Joseph's dreams over the 20 years of time? Joseph could not have known why he was unselfishly giving himself to other people to have their dreams to be answered, that God was blessing his dream at the same time. Three things, if you want to overcome obstacles. First, don't wait to be asked. I have a 76 
a second video with Andrea, if she's ready for that. I want you to watch this. It's about, it's a short book. It's called Five Short Chapters by Portia, can't remember her last name, but Five Short Chapters. Let's watch this. Okay, you ready? Turn the volume up so they can hear this. That's what it's saying. Autobiography in Five Short Chapters by Portia Lester. Chapter One. I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find a way out. Chapter Two. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. But my eyes are opened. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down another street. That's five short chapters. That was a little book, wasn't it? Oh, if I only had that when I went to college. Woo! Or seminary. Don't waste to be asked. Initiate action. Let God use you. Secondly, offer to take care of the details. Whatever it may be, when you work to other people and you serve other people, maybe you don't like them. Maybe you can't stand them. But look at them as if you were looking at Jesus Christ and work for them as, as if you're working for the Lord your God. And bless them. And lastly, be enthusiastic about the dream. You haven't gotten to the end of it yet. But God is still working. If you'll keep putting Him first, He's still working on your behalf. You and I don't see the outcome as He does. It took Joseph a little bit over 20 years. Some of you may have been 30 or 40 years in your dream. Some of you may be just are ready to see the dream happen this starting this very day. This very day. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to our hearts tonight, right now. What is He saying to you at this moment? What do you need to do? Is there something you need to surrender? Is there something you need to give up? There's a little boy one time who told God, he said, God, I don't have anything to give you. And he took his hat off and he put it on the ground and he put both feet into his hat. And he says, Lord, I'll give you everything inside of this hat. I'll give you me. That's all he wants. He just wants you to trust him. Give the best that you have. He loves you so much. He cares about everything there is in your life. Have you quit kicking because you're tired? Are you tired of the rat race and so therefore you just kind of quit and wait for other people to rescue you? Or is it about time you just keep kicking because you're almost at the end and the butter is churning? And when the butter is made, you know what's going to happen. You can bless other people. You can share your butter with someone. It might happen today at lunchtime. Have some hot bread, a little bit of butter on top of that. Mmm, tastes so good. Friend, you become the butter in the hands of the master. He wants you to be able to help bless other people. No, I'm not talking about cholesterols and things like that. He wants to use you because he knows how he can form you. He can mold you. He can use you any way you allow him to. I'd like to invite you just to stand with me just as we close. It's noon. It's time to... I want you to realize that he, he cares about everything there is in your life. And whatever plans you have for this day, whatever hopes and dreams you decide that he's wanting for you, somebody here probably like to pray. And I just want to open the altar. We have this altar here. It doesn't mean you've joined the church and it doesn't have any magic about it. It's a place for people to come and pray. Or the front pew, there's people who come and sit on the front pew. The big key is, are you willing to take a step out in front of all of these peers of yours, in spite of what anyone is saying, and say, I just need the help of Jesus today. You see, in a church like ours, we do things like that. There's so many other churches don't. It's so easy to hide behind where we are. I've made many steps to the altar. I remember times in my life that... I said, Lord, why am I coming to this altar again? He said, because here's where you meet me. Well, Lord, aren't you everywhere? Yeah. 
But today, I'm going to be at the altar talking to you here. Does everybody just need to come pray? Got anything on your heart today? You need to be saved. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to just step into your hat and give Him everything inside of the hat. Are you at the point of tired of kicking? And you just can't seem to do it any longer, but you need His help? See, I would hope that everybody in this room has got it all together. But I'm banking somehow by the law of averages of human nature. Some of us are just not there. This is not a judgment. This is not a time of condemnation. It's a time for you to realize that God loves you so much. I'm going to lead this song if it's okay. We'll sing this. And uh, if you'd like to come pray, just step out where you are. Someone will come pray with you. Oh, how he loves you and me.
to a cross and died for humanity. Stand with me. Amen. Let's be humble and let's serve Him with all goodness. Amen. Amen. Give someone a hug or a handshake or whatever else you want to give to them. Okay? <laughs> You're dismissed. God bless you.